What's up guys? It's yo boy Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn in Naruto as Nara and Uzumaki. Part 8. Like, share, and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also, remember to check out the original story. Link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Me and the rest of the Uzumaki? Maybe. But you, I don't think so. Even Hashirama, with his immense volumes of chakra practically surpassing even the QB, had very good control precisely due to the balanced ratio of energies generated by body and mind. Of course, his inclination towards Senjutsu played a significant role, but that was just another factor added to his repertoire in later stages of life. If you think about it, Hashikuen never lacked control from the beginning of his adulthood, as far as I can remember. So, does that mean I could even reach Tsunade's level if I pay proper attention to improving my control? I emphasize the main point. Exactly. You've inherited the best from your parents, avoiding the Uzumaki's deficiency of mediocre control despite their enormous amounts of chakra, nodded the Kunoichi. We have too much young energy, which overshadows Ian, blocking some from even using elemental transformations and medical techniques. And I'm free from such problems thanks to the Nara inheritance, I added, and my past life as well. Exactly why you were able to become an Irionin, confirmed Mito, even though your volume remains at the average Uzumaki level for your age. Yeah, and I've worked so hard to develop my reserves. It pays off with the ability to spend much less chakra from my side, I nodded understandingly at her words. After all, it's not so much about how much chakra you have, but how you use it. Of course, monsters like Mito and the elders of the Fuinjutsu clan will surpass me in total quantity alone, as will most Jinchuriki, but already now I'm approaching Kage level in volume. What will it be like by the time I'm 30? Ordinary, shinobi without the burden of an extra source in their belly will even leave Jiraiya behind. And yet, he's still considered to possess one of the largest reserves in Konoha after the Senju elders and Mito herself. This opens up new horizons for me, especially in Iryojutsu, I shook my head, finishing treating my battered body. With my previous control, I would have capped out at the second degree of Irionin at most. Now, I can even attempt to grow to Tsunade's level. But that's for later, for now. Ignoring my own not-so-clean state, I stood up and picked Mito up in my arms. Ryo. What are you doing? If half an hour deserves a reward, then what does victory deserve? I smirked, giving the red-haired beauty a carnivorous look. With an indescribable expression on her face, she looked at me, then stroked my cheek and sighed. It's good to be young, so full of strength and insatiable. You'll get your reward, all right. With a wide and satisfied smile, I headed home, ignoring the protests of my still recovering body. What's this? Perplexedly looking at the bundle thrown into my hands, I raised my gaze to our sensei. This is your gear and along with it, the field patents of Chunin's, replied Hyuga to us. Did you really think they'd send Jenin to the front lines? So, they've given us the rank only because they're sending us to war? Tsum grimaced, having received her scrolls together with Rotaro. Actually, they were supposed to give them to you half a year ago, judging by the number of missions completed and the Nukunins taken down, but due to certain circumstances, the decision was delayed, Kanade hinted, casting a suggestive glance in my direction. Shrugging off the less than thankful looks from my teammates, I sealed my scroll. And now what? Now you're free and can spend the remaining few days before deployment with your friends, family, and loved ones, replied Hyuga. No, I mean all of us, are we now a team of three, or do we still go to fight under your leadership? I clarified. Having received the rank of Chunin, you are now left to your own devices and obligated to independently enhance your skill level without the aid of an instructor. Of course, we'll continue going on missions together after the war, but from today onward, your team becomes an autonomous combat unit, with commanders who may often change, Kanade sadly smiled, as for the front line, 
I'll be heading to battle too, as I need to earn my Jonin rank, but I'm not sure which camp yet, maybe the same as yours, or perhaps a different one. Hmm, so that's how a team can have several teacher commanders, noted for the future, Ishii speculated, raising an eyebrow questioningly. And lastly, I appoint Ryo as the leader of your trio, the Kunoichi announced before parting ways. Why him? Inazuka immediately snapped, jealously glancing at me. Even though she had come to terms with my overwhelming advantage on all fronts, her fiery temperament often showed itself in flashes of irritation. Because he's a Nara and strategizes battle plans much better than the two of you combined, the sensei simply replied, and he's stronger than me as well, not to mention an excellent Irionin. Who else should be the commander, especially considering your impulsiveness and Rotaro's lack of leadership qualities? Growling softly, Inazuka didn't reply, abruptly turning away and leaving our company without a farewell. Those days? Ishii guessed, raising an eyebrow questioningly. Most likely, I agreed, watching her go. She usually keeps better control of herself and doesn't blow up over trivial matters. Ahem. Turning around, my partner and I noted the irritated face of Huga, who began demonstratively stretching her arms, and decided not to tempt fate, quickly leaving the Hokage Tower, near where the conversation had taken place. Waving goodbye to Rotaro, I swiftly leaped across rooftops towards home. I had expected a promotion soon, but usually the Hokage personally hands out the Chunin uniforms and patents to better understand his fighters, some of whom he's only seen a couple of times in his life. At least, that's how it happened with my stepbrother and his team. Here, however, our sensei received the scrolls at the administration and then handed them to us. Odd. Or our double standards applied here too. Tough luck, throughout my life in Kanoha, I haven't even had the legitimate chance to see our leader up close. I haven't seen him from afar either. What a bummer. Even Danzo noticed once, but not the relatively young Haruzan Sarutobi. Don't worry. I'm not planning to throw myself at Kanai with my chest bare. Once again, I tried to reassure mom, hugging and patting her head. What are you doing here? Just before my departure, Saya suddenly began crying, absolutely sure that I would die in the war. Given that she spent the last month on pins and needles, it's not surprising that by the end, her nerves couldn't take it. Alright, I won't mention that such excellent Irionines are always kept in the camp. Even now, I surpass the average Jonans in strength, forget about my mastery in both directions of Shinobi Yard, but I managed to bring down Mito Uzumaki herself in a full-fledged battle. Sure, it was a precise calculation on the element of surprise and a bit of preparation with a touch of luck, but few can hold out against an S-rank Kunoichi for more than 30 minutes and not kick the bucket. And you're afraid someone might kill me. If I encounter someone of that level, worst case scenario, I can definitely escape, not to mention anyone weaker. Promise me you'll come back alive, mom sniffled, wiping the tears streaming down her cheeks. Not even a direct heart wound can kill me, especially if someone manages to break through the reinforced seals on my clothes, I shook my head very seriously. Besides, I have one last resort, but that's a secret for now. But anyway, I promise. Finally calming down, Saya stepped back, allowing me to breathe a sigh of relief, there was only half an hour left until the deadline for the group of shinobi heading to the front, and I really didn't want to be late. Besides, I can always send you a clone with a letter so you won't get bored, I tried to cheer her up. Alright then, go and come back alive. Giving one last glance at Saya and casually noting her dreadful, cuteness, in such a tearful state with swollen lips, I smiled and headed towards the door. But as I was putting on my boots, I couldn't resist hugging her once more, who knows when we'll see each other next. By the way, since I promised, you promised too that you won't get into anything dangerous as usual, or else. Stepping back, I paused significantly and continued in a serious tone, when I return, someone's rear end will be in serious trouble, and I'm not joking. Without waiting for a response to my ultimatum, I dashed out of the house. Rio. Get back here, and I'll show whose rear end will be suffering now. The shout that followed me only lifted my spirits. Bounding across rooftops, I couldn't suppress the grin creeping onto my face, after such a farewell, mom would hardly torment herself with silly fears. Of course, I would feel more at ease personally keeping an eye on her, but there was nothing I could do about it now. 
The past month had flown by too quickly. But I managed to bid farewell to everyone at least once. Involuntarily recalling parting with Mito-chan and Linli, I barely held back a sudden rush of blood to my head. And not just for her. I wonder if they'll greet me the same way. If so, I'm ready to leave for war and return every month. The main thing is not both at once, I'd collapse under the strain. It's a pity that during the climax at the Uzumaki house, Kushina caught us, successfully breaking through the barrier to the bedroom. The only comfort is that the innocent child's mind couldn't handle the influx of images and shut down, and Mito later convinced her it was all a dream. Otherwise, I don't know how I would have had to explain and justify what happened. I'm not ready for that conversation. It's also disappointing that I'll miss Kushina's graduation. Shame. The only one I couldn't bid farewell to among the few close friends and family is Keiko, there's been no sign of her for about a year. Just over a year ago, she headed to the front and hasn't returned to the village since. But judging by the fact that the rented room is still listed under her name, she's still alive. And you can't even send a letter, we agreed not to communicate in such a way, considering it too simple a method for breaking years of encryption. Before, I had to hide because of age differences, and now because of clan complications revolving around me, Keiko surely didn't need that kind of attention. Arriving on time at the gathering place by the gates, I was struck by the number of shinobi and kunoichi assembled, on a rough estimate, there were over 500 people. And even though the overwhelming majority wore chunin jackets, the gathered strength was impressive. I had thought we were just joining the regular reinforcements for the front, usually around a hundred people. But here, there were already seasoned individuals gathered, judging by some of their scars, recently healed wounds are easy for a professional to distinguish, unlike me, regular irionines in the field patch up efficiently and crudely, without worrying about hiding traces on the skin. Hence, after the war, shinobi like Ibiki appear, frightening ordinary residents of Kanoha to nervous fits and wet pants. The character of scars on some clearly indicates where they fought, Sunagakir. Wind techniques leave such marks, if the fortunate ones manage to stay alive and not turn into a heap of chopped meat. It's strange that the Hokage decided on such an act, there's no desperate situation with IWA on the front to immediately throw resting troops into a new meat grinder. Although, Linli said about 2,000 went on leave and the same remained in place after Sunagakir's defeat, so here's about a quarter. Moreover, those bearing clan insignias aren't three times more than regular fighters. Given my knowledge of the canon, it's a disheartening observation. Is Hiruzen really starting to quietly reduce the number of clan shinobi? Sending out those who haven't fully recovered yet so quickly could significantly impact survival statistics right from the first clash. If someone's hand trembles from pain in a fresh scar, that's one less person. They'll say it was due to lack of strength or experience. It might seem like a natural loss, and the Hokage wouldn't be blamed for it, but gradually, the strength of the clans will diminish. After two bloody wars, the balance of power between hereditary clan ninjas and those trained from scratch will shift decidedly in favor of the latter, considerably easing Sarutobi's control over village governance. Some clans might even disappear altogether. Currently, there are about six minor clans in Kanoha that I haven't even heard of. Even the Hataki aren't entirely wiped out, besides Sakumo's family, who currently leads, there are still a couple of individuals left. After turning my head a bit, searching for friends and realizing that finding two relatively short people in such a crowd would be tricky, I scrambled up the nearest pillar and began scanning for my team from its top. This method bore fruit immediately, I spotted them near the wall to the right of the gates, in the company of our sensei. Descending, I skirted around the group of conversing people and hurried towards mine, our departure was imminent, and I wanted to be among the already established group. Who knows, we might still be ambushed on the way to the main camp, and having reliable comrades at your back in such a case is preferable. Hey, folks! Have you been standing here long? Yeah, it's been half an hour since we arrived, replied Rotaro, turning at the sound of my voice. But you didn't seem to be in a hurry. That's how it turned out, I shrugged, not elaborating on the reason. Indeed, I couldn't exactly say I had to calm down my mother's nervous breakdown about this very deployment. The main thing is I showed up right on time, I smirked, noticing Tsum's grimaced expression. 
Hmm, she's still brooding over my appointment as leader, and she clearly wanted to say something nasty about my tardiness, but a stern look from Kanade interrupted that impulse. Arriving precisely at the appointed time is good, but showing up a few minutes early is even better, neutrally remarked Huga, explaining to my questioning glance, I was just discussing with your teammates the procedure for moving large groups of shinobi through hostile territory. You don't need to worry, sensei, I waved off lightly, we covered this topic in detail at our clan sessions, in all its nuances. The positioning of support shinobi, sensor insurance in reconnaissance squads, the absence of allied groups larger than 9 within 300 meters, and similar conditions. Actually, military actions among shinobi can't even be called warfare in the sense it was understood in my previous world. Here, it's not armies against armies but our small mobile groups against the enemy's small mobile groups. Large gatherings of people in one place almost never happen because it's very convenient to wipe out such a target with a high-level shinobi technique. The same Tsuchikage with his Kekiai Tota can easily accomplish the task of destroying a small mountain with one blow, not to mention more vulnerable targets in one place. In this world, personal strength rules the battlefields, along with a bit of tactics and strategy. And thank the gods for that. Though those who use chakra for destruction have long departed from ordinary people, only a handful can compare to them in terms of destructive power. With the weapons that the Kage and Daimyo wield here, you can order coffins for the entire continent's population, given the bloodthirstiness and vindictiveness of the locals, only units out of tens of thousands will survive. Well, yeah, you're a Nara after all, Kanade nodded understandingly, sometimes I just forget about that. Yeah, after so many years with the Lazy Clan, I can confidently say that laziness is genetically passed down in men. On the other hand, women's aggressiveness is carefully cultivated from childhood, encountering a pathological desire to avoid work from husbands, brothers, sons, and fathers. Anyone can get wild and get used to using physical force for any reason to motivate getting off the couch. It's a miracle that my birth didn't create a need for this. I'll retire at 30 and then I'll be lazy as much as I want, I smirked. But for now, I have to take care of my own survival chances until then. Smiling, Hugo wanted to say something, but our conversation was interrupted, a commander of the entire reinforcement appeared, and the assembled fighters swiftly divided into groups. Those who had already fought did so habitually, while newcomers like us were under the guidance of recent mentors, though there weren't many of them. My name is Kagami Uchiha, and I am your direct commander for the duration of our journey to the border with IWA, introduced the serious man of respectable age for an active shinobi, dressed in field attire without any distinguishing marks. The method of movement is standard, newcomers move in the center. Scouts, report any suspicious movement immediately to me or my assistants. He gestured to two shinobi nearby. Sensors, stay alert and constantly monitor the surroundings. The rest, you already know, so let's move out. Through the wide gates of Kanoha, trios containing Hyuga, Aburaim, or Inazuka swiftly emerged, followed by everyone else, including us. If we dashed out of the village in a dense stream, by the forest border, the horde of shinobi had quickly spread over a fairly large area. This way, moving through the branches, one could detect several teams nearby, but certainly not a couple dozen. At the same time, in case of an attack, the nearest allies would always manage to come to each other's aid and buy time until more people arrived if necessary. We moved in the center with other newcomers and a small group of medical ninjas, whom I recognized by their portable first aid kits and pouches. There was no one familiar among them, but I didn't expect to find any. I primarily worked with the permanent hospital staff, most of whom weren't even genin and thus not subject to frontline deployment. Here, almost exclusively field medics had gathered, capable of holding their own, other enemies were typically eliminated at every opportunity. Indeed, cases where brilliant medics but inept fighters were sent to the field were far from rare, but among such survivors, there were only a few. Not everyone has a teacher like the Hokages, like Tsunade. For practically continuous days of travel, interrupted only by short sleep and the minute consumption of repulsive rations, more resembling a piece of shit in color and taste than something relatively edible, left nothing but deep irritation. Even the large quantity of food sealed with me in a huge amount did not leave its scroll, 
looking around at neighbors pressing against the tiles, I realized they might just maim me for the opportunity to eat normally. Obviously, many had grown tired of these very dry packs long ago. And judging by Leanly's stories, they don't feed any better in camps. So I decided to save the stock for truly dark and hungry days. Constant tense anticipation of an attack didn't add to the joy, but unlike the others, I could relax a bit, with my steadily increasing control, my sensor capabilities had increased quite decently, and I would know about the approach of the enemy much earlier than seeing them with my eyes. But we didn't encounter any IWA shinobi, and a few unlucky Nukunins didn't count, scouts took them out almost instantly. As a result, we arrived at the former territory of the Land of Stone, where Kanoha's main camp was now located, somewhat tired but whole and healthy. Trained fighters can move continuously for several days and then dive straight into battle, but since there were some inexperienced Chunin among the reinforcements, the commander set a more economical pace that allowed covering huge distances in a day, even for those with modest chakra reserves. Upon arrival, the camp itself didn't impress me much, temporary earth-style homes studded with techniques, heaps of tents, and around it all, a six-meter wall, again constructed with the help of Doton. That was about it. I counted the camp's inhabitants, not as many as one might think, just over a thousand. Considering that the overwhelming majority came out to greet us, my rough estimates weren't far off from reality, even accounting for patrols, secrets, and simply those resting. At most, 2,000. And this is the main camp. Clearly, Iwagakure's last attack severely depleted our forces, as at the war's onset on this front, there were 8,000 fighters. Adding two smaller camps of a thousand each at best and Kanoha's losses in the Second World War become very significant. At the war's start, there were around 21,000 in formation, now, less than half remain, with only Suna having surrendered, and AIM and IWA next in line. After arrival, the commanders went to report to the local chief, and we were dispersed to rest in the barracks until morning. Assignments were to be received at the headquarters bunker immediately, so people sprawled out to sleep with clear consciences, including my less enduring partners, while I decided to wander around the camp. Frankly, I regretted it, there was a rather heavy atmosphere there, to put it mildly. Despite the apparent joy at such a large reinforcement, when did they last receive any, the vast majority of shinobi and kunoichi bore traces of exhaustion, both physical and moral. Some had such empty looks that I instinctively recoiled and quickened my pace, trying not to get too close. I was no longer surprised to see small groups, passing around bottles of sake or sharing a single pipe. The serene and almost happy faces of smokers raised suspicions that the pipe's contents were anything but tobacco. However, it should be noted that such groups were relatively few in plain sight, indicating that discipline was maintained quite strictly, considering the circumstances and the state of the subordinates, of course. Wandering aimlessly, I happened to catch sight of a very familiar pineapple-shaped hairstyle belonging to a shinobi leaning against the wall. Approaching closer, I confirmed it was indeed Shikaku. Ha, huh, didn't expect to see that lazy ass here. Hey, Shikaku. Hey there. I cheerfully greeted my cousin as soon as I got within speaking distance without needing to shout. The lazy one slowly opened his eyes and focused them on me. Ryo and I, I? Trouble. Can't even sleep peacefully now. Oh, you're always sleeping, so drag your lazy butt up and open your eyes. You'll have plenty of time to laze around. That's when I noticed new adornments on Shikaku's face, besides the emerging beard. Hmm, where did you get those scars? I asked him as my cousin grunted and struggled to stand up, dusting off his pants. The still red scars indicated the relative freshness of his injuries, received from rather shoddy medical ninjas who had only roughly pulled together the edges of the damaged flesh. It looked more like the work of a novice student than a qualified specialist. We got pinned down a week ago in a patrol by some stone neen, the guy jerked his cheek, wincing in pain. Sarutobi sensei died covering our retreat, and we ended up with these troublesome marks as a souvenir. All right, stay still. I'll patch you up a bit now, and it'll lighten up, I frowned, ignoring Shikaku's hesitant objections and using my mystical palm. I managed to completely heal wounds that had just started to close on their own in just half an hour, but my cousin asked to leave the scars, now diminished in size and faded, as a reminder. 
By the way, a competent medical ninja could have done all this in about the same time, I remarked, and you wouldn't have had to endure pain because of the clumsiness of the idiot who patched you up. Where can we find such a normal medic, sighed Shikaku, the field hospital was located right in the main camp, where all the decent specialists were wiped out in one fell swoop, turning the fortified building into dust. Damn, did such a kid really not spare himself? So it turns out that we're left with only those medics who were in small support points and the second camp. They can patch up a wound in battle or afterward, but they no longer have the skills to fully heal. They've pulled them all here now, leaving just a few or none in other places, I cursed. And after all this, they still don't want to increase funding for training new staff at the hospital. At this rate, we'll only have a couple of trained medics for every 500 shinobi, and only one of them will be capable of anything serious. Do you think anyone cares? Certainly not the Hokage and his advisors, Shikaku grimly smirked. On the front lines, they always have a personal medic ready to tend to the smallest scratch, while the rest have to fend for themselves. When I return to Konoha, I'll raise the issue in the clan about creating our own hospital department for clans and allies, I said darkly. Let anyone try to object, there will be a fuss over taijutsu. Hospital provision is getting worse every year, and with the loss of competent specialists, the quality will noticeably decline. I don't think Odo-san will object, during the war, he felt firsthand the need to have some medic nearby. Just like me. So you can count on my support in this matter. Great. And the fact that I can later slot in the necessary people into this department, that's another matter. For example, we can pick up Nono, or Momo, and no Danza will dare to approach the Kunoichi working for the clans. Eventually, the one-eyed old man will find something else to occupy himself with, rather than trying to recruit back a former employee who's settled into a comfortable position. And wherever this woman is, Kabuto will sooner or later appear. Without Orochimaru's influence, we can turn him into quite a decent person and a brilliant medic, simultaneously removing a huge threat from the horizon if that snake somehow gets Kuchios at Otensei. Actually, Abito isn't familiar with that technique, and the snake Sanin is too possessive to share such a dangerous technique with temporary allies. So only the owners of the Sharingan and Rinnegan will remain with a horde of clones. Definitely better than a crowd of invincible S-class shinobi and former Kage of all villages, I sighed, putting off such musings for the future. We still have two wars to survive, not to make plans for the fourth shinobi world war. By the way, since your sensei died, who's in charge of your team now? I asked my cousin, who was starting to doze off again. It couldn't be that no one was looking after the heirs of the clans. We've been taken under the wing of Kato Dan, one of the strongest unaffiliated shinobi, if you've heard of him, Shikaku sighed. Of course, not at the level of the Hokage's or Sukumo's students, but stronger than Sarutobi Sensei. Got it, I nodded. When are they planning to send you back to the village, anyway? Are you kidding? After the recent losses, we'll only rest at the end of the war, the guy grimaced. Well, maybe he's exaggerating, but it's quite possible. Then I'll be stuck here not for a year, as I had planned, but for a much longer time. Damn, I don't want to leave Saya alone for such a long period. By the way, where have they assigned you, my cousin asked after a brief silence. I still don't know. We arrived only today, but I don't think it's to the main camp, we have a team balanced in all shinobi skills, so they might send us where manpower is most needed and a good medic is constantly required. Most likely, we're facing the most losses at support points and patrols right now, so be careful, always expect attacks from underground and move predominantly through the trees, Shika advised. That's exactly how they caught us, excellent camouflage of those on the surface and an unexpected attack from below. Got it. How are the losses overall? Almost every day someone gets grazed or killed. They're afraid to attack the main camp after the last time with large forces, but small groups are constantly stinging, just like we do to them. Damn, in such an environment, my sensor skills will definitely come in handy. Dreadful. I shuddered, glancing at the darkening sky and deciding to wrap up the conversation. Alright, I'm going to rest. Say hi to the guys for me. Yeah, I usually hang around near the hospital or in the barracks, so if they assign me here, find me, Shikaku lazily nodded, waving goodbye. Watching him slowly shuffle towards the rough structures, 
almost scraping the ground with his feet, I shook my head. My cousin had changed a lot over this time, and even the lazy expression on his face had worn off, sometimes replaced by fatigue and complete indifference in his gaze. Like leanly, but not to that extent. And he hasn't been fighting as long as Senju. Damn, will the war affect me like this too? Considering how medics get used to blood, injuries, and corpses, I'll rely on professional immunity. Unfortunately, I've had hopeless patients too, but I prefer not to think about them or even remember, rejoicing in the large number of hopeless cases, for less experienced colleagues, scratched out of the clutches of death. Sighing, I shook my head and headed towards the tent provided for us, while there's a chance, it's important to rest well in safety. After receiving an assignment, such luxury will have to be forgotten for a long time. The next morning, Sensei woke us up with the sunrise and handed us a scroll with directions. You're being sent with two other teams to a small outpost that recently lost half of its staff in an unexpected attack, she explained in response to our questioning looks. I've been assigned to the second camp, so this is likely the last time we'll see each other for quite a while. Try not to die and always stick together. And you too, Sensei, I replied for everyone. You can count on that, the girl weakly smiled. Meet in half an hour at the western wall, so hurry up with breakfast and getting ready. After saying goodbye to Kanade, we quickly wolfed down the already despised field rations, washing them down with water from our flasks, and gathered our gear, unpacked the previous evening. As a result, we approached the western wall of the camp even a few minutes earlier, immediately noticing six shinobi. Apparently, those are the two teams that are supposed to go with us. With a practiced glance, I immediately identified among the four shinobi and two kunoichi a Achiha girl, protecting her left side. Clearly, the wound isn't fully healed. And they send such ones to the front? Something's not right here. Another notable feature among the assembled teams is the overwhelming majority of clan members, among us, only Rotaro and one other guy are ordinary, while the rest all have clan insignia. Good morning, senpai, we're on duty with you, I greeted everyone who had just turned their attention to us. And good morning to you, nodded the eldest shinobi among them, a jonin who looked about 25. The others were much younger than him and graduated about four years ahead of me, only reaching the rank of Chunin, judging by their jackets. But practically all of them had a decent chakra reserve, as expected from clan members. Are we waiting for someone? Tsum asked those present. A Jonin should come over who will guide us to our further place of service, replied a Yamanaka unfamiliar to me. Hmm, quite a thought-provoking mix here, Achiha, Hyuga, Lucky with a sensor, Yamanaka, Inazuka, Nara, or Uzumaki, considering my status as a half-blood, Maido, one of the smaller clans, and Aburame. Why no Senju, it's clear, but while wandering around the camp and observing people who have been traveling with us for a few days, I didn't notice the Sarutobi clan and their allies in the same numbers as all the other Kanahagakur clans but Sato. They'll probably flash by once or twice, suspicious. Could Hiruzen have quietly started undermining opponents in the political arena? If so, could that be why they sent me and my team here, not just randomly? According to all the rules, they could have left me in the village or at least assigned me to the main camp's field hospital, but that didn't happen. Damn, this isn't good. Did my friendship with the new Jinchuriki attract Hiruzen's attention and company? Did they decide to send me far away just in case? I can only hope they don't know my true capabilities, beyond what was demonstrated during missions and training with friends like Kanade. Only a fool wouldn't recognize them as A and B U. It's no secret that Mito taught me Kenjutsu, but I rarely remove training seals in front of strangers, demonstrating the speed and strength of a new Jonin, but not exceeding it. So now I just need to figure out what role they got rid of me in, like, he'll die on his own, just don't get in our way, or should I expect a stab in the back? HM. Suppressing a flare-up of paranoia with considerable effort, I shook my head, maybe it's all in my head, and there's no conspiracy to weaken clans, and they just sent our team to the front because we've gained enough experience? Alright, I'll keep my ears pricked, but for now, I should focus on other things rather than spinning unnecessary suspicions. Noticing Achiha grimacing once again, shifting from foot to foot, I decided not to waste any time. Quickly approaching the girl, I kneeled down to her level to inspect the wound. 
I apologize, I cautiously lifted the vest of the frozen kunoichi and the shirt underneath, reaching the injured area. And couldn't help but curse. Damn, who treated you like this? The swollen scar, still oozing blood, made a disgusting impression. Of course, the body will take its course in a couple of weeks, but during all this time, the girl should be lying in bed, not wandering around the battlefield. And it feels like someone not the weakest and most talentless Irionin worked on the wound, but rather a self-taught one. The last thought, coupled with a realization of the pride of the red-eyed ones, filled me with suspicions. Self-taught? Did you happen to engage in self-treatment? I asked in the most serious tone, frowning sternly and even pushing up my glasses for a greater effect. Blushing and already opening her mouth to protest, the kunoichi choked on her words and began to pale rapidly. I don't hear an answer. I didn't take my eyes off the girl's gaze, ignoring the surrounding ones who had started to discreetly move away. I? I did, the Uchiha whispered softly, looking at me like a rabbit caught by a snake. No, I don't even have appropriate words to describe this fool. Can you imagine trying to treat a serious wound without proper training and without consulting any medic? Next time such a brilliant idea pops into your head, it would be better to just go headbutt a wall, it would be more beneficial. I couldn't resist making a venomous comment. Now I'll patch up the wound quickly so you can move properly, but as soon as we reach our destination, you're coming to me for proper treatment, understood? Why yes, the kunoichi quickly nodded, swallowing nervously. Excellent. I activated the medical ninjutsu and got to work, hastily patching up the injuries and easing the pain. Of course, with active movements, for a shinobi, it could still reopen, but at least for now. It took about 10 minutes in total, but relief was visibly evident on Uchiha's face. Hey, Saki, who's that? I caught a whisper from one of the chunin. Not Aburame, the kunoichi's short reply amused me a bit. That's enough. Be careful with this side when running, and you'll make it to our destination without trouble, I said, getting up and adjusting my clothing. And by the way, everything I said earlier applies to all of you as well, understood? I gave a stern look to the others from both teams. Even the Jounin nodded like a blockhead. Why do they all look so pale? Only then did I notice the considerable wave of chakra emanating from the surroundings. Oops. It seems training with Mito wasn't entirely useless in this regard. Oddly enough, she mentioned barely feeling it. Ahem, what's going on here? Conducting an educational discussion on the topic of timely treatment of battle wounds, I reported, turning to the owner of the voice and the significant chakra presence, which I sensed a minute earlier. A fairly ordinary-looking Jounin in his thirties with tanned skin and slightly eastern facial features, at least, his eye shape was closer to Japanese than everyone else's around, was dressed in worn-out field attire, evidently supposed to be our guide. Well, that's a useful thing, but it's time for us to move out to the post where you've been assigned, the shinobi shrugged in bewilderment. I hope you're ready? Yes. Great, he nodded approvingly at the responses. Then follow me. Effortlessly leaping onto the wall, the Jounin nodded to the guards and jumped down on the other side. We had no choice but to follow him. Moving mechanically in a triangle formation with the other teams, with Hyuga and his comrades at the apex, the formation that had been drilled into us in Kanade, I focused on detecting enemies. The last thing we needed was to stumble into an ambush on the first day of the war. I think, along with the pale-eyed one, we'll spot any threat. The Great Council of Kanahagakur usually gathers once or twice a month to discuss urgent issues and ways to resolve them, requiring not only the Hokage's willingness but also the support of clan heads. At this council, the most important news from the fronts during the war is also discussed, along with reports from various services of Kanoha. This time, despite the absence of most clan heads, the meeting was still scheduled, the first time since Hiruzen's return to the village. Representatives of the merchant clans arrived early and in full force, unlike half of the shinobi council. The heads of the Nara, Yamanaka, and Akamichi clans, fighting on the front lines against IWA, were absent. There were also vacancies for Inazuka, Hyuga, and Uchiha, who remained to guard the border with Sunagakir. Of the five minor clans, only the head of the Yurin clan, allies of Sarutobi, was present. The ANBU commander was also absent from his place, but he was represented by Shimura Danzo as the second in the chain of command of the route. 
Not far from him sat the hospital chief, the one-eyed, grizzled Huga, covered in pale scars and deep wrinkles, clearly indicating his advanced age. Hishi Huga not only saw with his single eye the creation of the village but also participated in clan wars, leading the medical ninjas of the clan only after losing his left eye in battle. By the time of Kanoha's construction, he was the most competent medical ninja with some organizational skills aside from Hashirama, so the first Hokage entrusted him with the task of creating a full-fledged hospital. Hishi Huga successfully fulfilled this duty, holding his position for decades. Usually, the one-eyed old man was distinguished by considerable geniality, and rarely did any of his subordinates see him upset or angry, which had a very positive effect on the employees of Kanoha's main hospital. However, this time the village council had to witness a visibly angered Huga, as evidenced by the weak chakra waves emanating from the veteran and the bulging veins on his right temple from an active Byakugan. While this effect remained almost imperceptible to strong shinobi, ordinary people felt very uncomfortable and quietly perspired in anticipation of the Hokage, trying to distance themselves from such a restless neighbor as much as possible. However, the wait did not last long, as a couple of minutes after the last council member took their seat, the doors of the hall swung open and Hiruzen Sarutobi appeared, accompanied by his usual advisors. After responding to the greetings of those assembled, the Hokage and his advisors took their places at the head of the table, and the village leader signaled to the ANBU guards to lock the entrance, thus marking the beginning of the session. The first thing Hiruzen did was to give a dressing down to the ordinary members of the council who had squandered the village's inviolable reserve allocated for the most urgent needs, including hospital supplies. It was news to the shinobi that a substantial sum of money had already been withdrawn from the accounts of those who attempted such dealings. Old Huga grinned happily and, with a meaningful squint towards the peaceful part of the council, began to ponder how to avenge the people responsible for such dismal support of his beloved hospital. Lost in sweet dreams of revenge, he paid no attention to the discussion of the embassy to Suna and the terms of signing a peace treaty with the defeated village. Indeed, the veteran was not overly concerned with the political maneuvers of the village leadership. Much more important was the fact that most competent medical ninjas were being sent to the front, and the remaining staff simply could not meet the demand for qualified medical personnel. Therefore, the old Huga patiently waited his turn and tried not to exert too much chakra on those around him, remembering the number of shinobi who did not survive due to lack of timely qualified assistance and those who became disabled due to the lack of medicines in the hospital. Huga-san, what can you say about the hospital? The Hokage addressed the veteran, after all the more pressing issues had been discussed and decisions made. I can say a lot, and the overwhelming majority of those words would make even dock workers blush, so I'll just present the statistics, the medical ninja grimaced. Over the past year, 329 shinobi have died simply because they did not wait their turn for treatment or due to the absence of necessary medicines at the time of surgery. Another 700 remain disabled simply because all available personnel were occupied saving the dying. At present, there are only 93 medical ninjas of the 4th and 5th degrees working in the main hospital and its branches, 12 of the 3rd degree, and only 3 of the 2nd degree. Not a single 1st degree. Considering that just a month ago we were already struggling with an influx of patients, and after the recent departure of a significant number of experienced staff to the front with IWA, it can be confidently stated that losses will only continue to rise. I have on my desk about 20 resignation letters simply because medical ninjas do not even have time to properly rest between shifts, and cases of fainting due to simple chakra exhaustion are becoming more common. Moreover, over the past three years of war, the number of medics has have due to combat losses, with about 20 new ones coming in, none of whom have risen above the fourth degree. If this trend continues and the village does not allocate funds for the training of new medical ninjas, then in the near future, combat losses will reach a much more significant figure, and recovery after the war will take us more than a decade. That's all from me. After the hospital director's report, a tense silence hung in the council chamber. The Hokage and his advisors, being responsible for such matters, felt very uneasy. It was one thing to economize on the already insufficient wartime budget, but quite another to undermine the village's defense capability, increasing the already significant losses on the battlefield. 
You know, Hiruzen, refusing to fund the medical program looks completely different in light of the information provided by Hishidano, remarked the head of the Senju suspiciously squinting. Perhaps, but that doesn't change the fact that Kanoha cannot afford such expenses now or three years ago, reclined in his chair, Hokage said, puffing on his pipe. Perhaps when we receive contributions from Suna, the situation will change, but not before. In that case, I want to raise the issue of transferring the officials provided by the Irionines to the hospital on a permanent basis, because the current situation needs to be addressed somehow, Hugo frowned, drilling the village head with his single eye. He didn't mention that among them were Irionines serving the Hokage and his family, as well as elders and some council members who had gained such a privilege for themselves, but those present perfectly understood the hint. This idea certainly deserves attention given the current situation, supported Aburame the veteran. Indeed, Hiruzen, medical assistance can be provided at the hospital, and qualified Irionines are now needed to quickly get the wounded back on their feet, rather than gathering dust in some bureaucrat's backside, scoffed Uzumaki Mito. Besides, it wouldn't be shameful for the Hokage to descend to the level of his subordinates. Despite her infrequent attendance at council meetings, tense relations with Yuzushiogakure, and few clan representatives, no one dared to question the removal of the Uzumaki's rightful place among the village's leadership. This is something the younger Kunoichi had recently used to stay informed. A great idea indeed, Toka Senju quickly joined her friend. Sarutobi barely held back a grimace, although he could veto this issue, all clan heads would simply not understand him. Given the existing dissatisfaction due to the heavy losses in the war, risking the loss of a large share of respect among his shinobi for small privileges was not worth it. All right, until the end of hostilities, these Irionines will be transferred to work in the hospital, Sarutobi agreed, ignoring the outraged faces of non-shinobi council representatives. Indeed, they had the sense not to voice their protest aloud, especially under the piercing gaze of the one-eyed Hyuga. The elders were much better at keeping their composure and showed no sign of irritation, although the loss of personal medics turned out to be unexpectedly unpleasant. If no one has any further questions, Hokage paused, allowing those present to speak up, then I declare this council meeting adjourned. You are all dismissed. The next meeting will be held in a month as scheduled. The attendees wasted no time and within a few minutes, the chamber emptied. Damn that old geezer, cursed Mitokado, slumping into a visitor's chair in the Hokage's office. He's starting to bring up very uncomfortable topics. After the meeting, the four students of the Senju brothers moved to Hiruzen's office to discuss certain matters among themselves and away from prying ears. It's high time we replaced him with our person, Koharu smirked, sitting down on the couch. Hyuga won't allow that, and the Senju will support him, Sarutobi shook his head, emptying his pipe and preparing to refill it. And most clans will be on their side, considering that Hishisan has long proven himself as a top-notch specialist and manager. Given his age, it would be easier to wait for him to retire than actively push the old man out of the hospital director's position. Moreover, even with such a skillful hospital director, clans continue to lose people, albeit not as quickly as we anticipated, shrugged Danzo. The process is nearing completion with the end of hostilities, and the military influence of the clans will significantly weaken, increasing the Hokage's power. The main thing is not to rush too much, otherwise the Naras themselves might uncover the true motives behind all this, and we'll all be in trouble, Hiruzen exhaled smoke from his pipe. Then we can also deal with the emergence of competitors. Sakumo himself has gained considerable political weight during the war with Sunagakure and could well vie for my seat with the support of at least a third of the clans. I'll take care of that, promised the head of N.E. Not right away, of course, and maybe not within a year, but I'll be able to prepare an operation to eliminate him or at least tarnish his reputation. Better the latter, since removing an S-rank shinobi could turn out to be too troublesome and costly, and you already have too few well-trained people, added Hamura. All right, we'll soon humble the Senju a bit, so get ready to press Hataki, nodded the Hokage, but even the lowest genin shouldn't suspect your involvement in the setup. The operatives won't be able to say anything to anyone, nodded Shimura, I guarantee it. We reached our destination approximately five hours later, without encountering any potential enemies along the way. 
If I'm not mistaken about the distance, we were on the territory of Kuzagakur, having left Takigakur behind, not far from which the main camp was located. Honestly, a couple of small unkempt buildings clearly erected hastily with earth-style techniques, and a cluster of tents didn't impress me. I could only be glad that this outpost, barely a hundred people, had some kind of wall, albeit one and a half times smaller than the abandoned Kanoha troop position. Judging by the tents guards and another Hyuga at the gates, periodically using the Byakugan, attacks here seem to occur quite often. In any case, they didn't keep us at the gate for long, clearly recognizing the leading Jonin. Our entire group headed towards the largest structure, obviously serving as the command headquarters and residence, trying not to pay attention to the indifferent tired looks of the people nearby. It's quite obvious that participating in a war instills such indifference even in rookies, if they manage to survive. Gesturing for us to wait, the shinobi pushed aside the curtain at the entrance and slipped inside. Ikisan, reinforcements have arrived. Despite the quiet muttering of the companions and the muffled sounds echoing off the walls, I heard our guide clearly. Meat has arrived? Let them in. However, I didn't like the response at all, it meant that the losses among the inhabitants of this outpost were numerous and frequent enough to treat reinforcements this way. The shinobi who appeared again in the doorway beckoned us to follow. Naturally, no one objected, and we entered the local headquarters. Or rather, the room trying to pass for it, because stone furniture, consisting of a large table and a bunch of chairs, and bare walls didn't make an impression. The only attraction was another jonin sitting at the table, sorting through a small stack of papers. Probably reconnaissance reports or something similar. The shinobi himself didn't stand out in any particular way from other 30-something killers I had already seen, and if not for his missing right ear, it would be difficult to remember his face in just a couple of days. However, this didn't apply to the shinobi's chakra, the local commander turned out to have an impressive reserve, just slightly short of Kage's size. This led me to quite definite thoughts. Quickly inspecting the man's clothes, who was also scrutinizing us attentively, I found the Mido clan patch. So, this must be his chapter. Iki Mido. Essentially, a small clan of about 40 people managed to stay in the village council solely thanks to his efforts and personal merits. A talented fighter, a decent politician, and an excellent saboteur, if my uncle's stories are to be believed. A rank in the bingo book with a substantial reward for both alive and dead. The only question is, what demon did he forget in this hole? Frankly, individuals like him should be kept if not in the main camp, then certainly nearby, not given command over a pathetic handful of subordinates. So, I am Iki Mido, and from this day forth, I am your direct superior, the shinobi announced without beating around the bush. Therefore, all orders given are to be executed promptly and accurately, no fighting among yourselves or debating whose clan is better, understood. The overwhelming surge of killing intent made us take his warning seriously. Of course, next to my red-haired mentor, Mido wasn't even close, but judging by the slightly trembling and pale neighbors, the Chunin had more than enough. By the way, after the commander's show of strength, I earned a keenly interested glance, as he didn't even acknowledge the attempt to impress newcomers. After scrutinizing us a bit longer with a heavy gaze, the shinobi continued. I'll review your papers later, for now, introduce yourselves and give a brief description of your abilities. A standard procedure for unfamiliar people forced to work together for some time. While the neighbors introduced themselves, I simply waited my turn, not bothering to memorize names and abilities, they typically focused on one specialization, even with training under the Senju. The situation hadn't changed much among the clans. Business as usual, just as expected from the Uchiha or Aburame. Ryo Nara, third degree Irionin, good Taijutsu and Fuenjutsu, also proficient in several clan Haidenjutsu and Ninjutsu. During my brief introduction, Mido's eyebrows raised. The infamous Ryo Nara? It's strange they sent you to fight at all, let alone didn't leave you in the main camp, the shinobi chuckled. But an excellent Irionin and seal master will be useful to us. Judging by the sideways glances, the clan was aware of me and the others. Seems like I won't just be one of the masses. Well, that wasn't exactly what I wanted anyway. Alright, you're free for today, rest and settle in. Tomorrow at 9, come to me for assignments, sighed the jonin, 
tiredly rubbing his eyes. Nodding understandingly, our group of Chunin quickly headed for the exit, but the commander's voice made me pause. Ryo, please stay. Yes? I waited until everyone had left before turning to the commander. Since you're currently our only medic with any degree of proficiency, take charge of the infirmary, Mido informed me, then clarified, it's the second building. All right, are there medical supplies there? I nodded. Some are left, the shinobi replied, his mood darkening slightly. So, here too, supplies are severely lacking, not just in Kanoha. Sighing, I bid farewell to the command and went to settle into my accommodation for the next few months. Except it wasn't a cluster of tents on one side of the camp but the infirmary building, if I was responsible for it, I should stay close by. Setting up didn't take much time since a two-person tent with everything needed was already assembled, just waiting to be unpacked from the scroll. Moments like these make you truly appreciate Fuinjutsu's capabilities. And considering it was a high-comfort tent with a built-in multifunctional protective barrier, crafted by Uzumaki masters, not all jonin could afford such luxury, better to settle away from overly curious individuals. After unpacking from the scroll a large piece of meat wrapped in special fire-resistant paper and a large pot of rice and vegetables, all still hot, I had a hearty lunch and silently rejoiced that my food scrolls were stocked with ready meals for at least half a year ahead. Army rations had worn me out during the journey. Besides, I didn't want to lose the muscle mass I had worked so hard to build. I had seen such patients enough back at the hospital, all the body's resources went into numerous battles, and in case of serious injury, there wasn't enough strength or reserves left for recovery. Then these poor souls would lie with four drips, recovering for months. Once settled in, I headed to inspect the infirmary. It was the same rough structure as the others, makeshift for the campaign conditions. Basic futons were thrown over the beds, and weak fuin lamps provided the lighting, just a couple of them. That's it. In these conditions, it was hard to expect more. The only thing that pleased me was a box with essential medical supplies for treating wounds and bandaging, tucked against the far wall. After all, disinfecting a wound and using blood-stopping powder was much simpler and more economical than relying solely on chakra and my own medical ninjutsu skills. And there might not have been even that much. Sure, I had brought some medicines with me, but how long would they last with a constant stream of wounded? Narasan? The sensation of approaching chakra and a familiar voice distracted me from sorting through the medicine box. Glancing back, I noticed an Uchiha at the entrance. Ah, so she hadn't ignored my request. Come in and lie down wherever you want, I'll finish up here and then take care of you, I nodded, returning to my task. A couple of minutes later, I had a clear idea of what to expect from the local supplies, so it was time to fulfill my direct duties. So, I'll heal your wound now, but remember, self-treatment with barely controlled mystical hand techniques and serious injuries is suicide. It's safer to get help from a proper specialist. If you're interested, I can even give you a few lessons. The Kunoichi nodded in agreement and even attempted a bow from her lying position. I beg you to take care of me, sensei. I halted her attempt with a gentle tap on her forehead. Locals generally held teachers in high regard, especially if they were medical ninjutsu specialists. Age didn't matter, even if I was five or six years younger than the Kunoichi, that fact wouldn't change the respect shown. Otherwise, they wouldn't listen to a nine-year-old in the hospital. In my previous world, this would have been absurd, but here, it was a real situation that hardly surprised anyone. Considering that not long ago, clans sent children as young as eight or ten to war, considering them adults in earnest, why be surprised? It didn't take me long to fully heal the wound, thanks to skills long honed, but still, in the past hour, the infirmary had filled with quite a large number of people who had heard about the arrival of a proper medical ninjutsu practitioner. After finishing with the girl, I instructed her to take it easy for a few days and eat well so her body could recover properly, then turned to the other patients. I even had to enlist the help of a few clones, otherwise, I wouldn't have managed with 20 people by evening. But what surprised me the most was the similarity of problems among the fighters seeking help, some of whom were brought in despite resistance from neighbors or friends' wounds that were inadequately treated or poorly set fractures, cases of self-treatment without proper training. There was even one man with a shoulder that had just started to knit, 
who hadn't received any medical assistance beyond a simple bandage. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.